Well, come on, let's give the Lord one more big hand clap tonight. Come on, let's really give the Lord a hand clap. We love you. We worship you. We magnify you. We bless your name. We say you're great and you're greatly to be praised. You are God and there is none like you. If you're comfortable with it, just lift a hand to heaven right where you are. Father, we lift up holy hands now according to the word of God. Not because of a feeling or, a, or an emotion, but in obedience to your word without wrath, without doubting. We commit ourselves afresh and anew. Come on, we commit ourselves afresh and anew to your will, your way, your word, your life, your truth. Father, make us more like Jesus, we pray. Lead us and guide us. I pray you lead us and guide us. I think that these hands are for blessing lifted in the air. These hands are for healing. These hands are for helping. These hands are for grabbing people and reaching them higher in life. Father, we say these are your hands, your feet, your mouth, your eyes. Use us how you see fit, oh Lord. We say you are the God and we are the man. Now come on, let's pray for this city. We had a shooting just the other night at the fair. Father, we pray right now for everyone affected by that shooting. Father, we come against the spirit of violence and murder and anger in our city and we command it to stop. It's back to be broken. It to bow its knee to the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We speak to the storm. We say, peace, be still. We thank you for healing and help and health in all those lives. Father, I thank you that fear and terror will not reign or rule in West Texas or Amarillo. Father, I thank you that it will not reign or rule in, around any of our campuses, that our people are protected. We thank you for Psalm 91. Angels hold us up lest we dash our foot against a stone. Now, touch all those people affected, help, and bless them. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray for them, and we believe that it is done, and the church said, amen, amen, amen. Why don't you turn to your neighbor? Yeah, yeah, you give the Lord one more hand clap. You could turn to your neighbor when you're done clapping and say you're blessed. You got to sit by me tonight. They are blessed. They got to sit by you tonight, and I'm blessed to be here with you. It's exciting to be with you on a Wednesday night to teach the Word of God. I don't know about you, but I like Wednesday night church. Can I get an amen out there? You're here. You like it, or, or you wouldn't be here. And, uh, you know, people have been having less church services over the last decade. It's kind of been the fad that's went through the church in America. And uh, back in the day, I remember having like two and a half, three-hour services on Sunday morning. Anybody remember that? You went, you went and ate. And uh, then you would come back to church. We'd have like six or seven o'clock night service where you would go round two and it would be like two hours. And, uh, you know, then Sunday nights when you got it on like Donkey Kong, I mean, you prayed, you prophesied, you got on the floor, you got on your knees, you got back up, you got anointed with oil. It was all of it, right? It was, it was like charismatic movement days. And then something happened. I, I don't know. We got uh, busy. I remember I heard... Um, uh, it was, it was they, they had the largest church in South Africa back in the day, Rama Church. Their name was Macaulay. And I remember hearing them preach when I was a kid, busy, B-U-S-Y, being under Satan's yoke, my early 20s. Busy, right? We're so busy being under Satan's yoke. It was a great message. Because, you know, do you know what the stats show? How many hours the average American is on their cell phone and social media a day now? I mean, it's mind-blowing. I can't remember the stat, but let's call it seven hours a day because it sounds good, right? Seven hours a day, whatever. So we're busy, but what are we busy doing, right? Our work days get smaller. We produce less. The stats are all showing that. We're busy being distracted. So I remember talking to Dr. Morocco, uh, King's Cathedral. Doc preaches here. I, I love Doc, a mentor, dear friend in my life. Talk to him today. I'm like, what are you doing today, Doc? He's like, we're opening up four new locations in Arizona today, Brian. Four in one day. He's like, what are you doing, son? I'm like, I'm just sitting on the couch right now. You know, I feel like a loser when I talk to you, Doc. So two in, two in Phoenix, two in uh, Tucson. Um, he's doing today or this week. Is It was this week. And uh, I remember... You know, he still has Sunday night service. When you're there, he preaches you, almost tries to kill you. So he'll pre you'll preach, and then he'll fly you from one island. You'll go from Maui to Oahu. Then when you're done there, he'll fly you to Kauai. When you're done there, he'll fly you to another island because he's got churches everywhere. And they preach you till literally you think you're going to die. And then once you feel like you're going to die, they resurrect you, and then you get to go on vacation, which is awesome. But he said, I refuse to shut down our church services. Everybody else is just doing Sunday mornings. So the Spirit of God spoke to me and said, if we just uh, stop having church instead of people filling themselves with the things of God, 
they'll fill themselves at that time with the things of the world. And I watch, I'm like, Doc is right. At the time, I'm like, Doc's a little old school, and I appreciate that, but Doc is right. How many of y'all have noticed as Americans stop going to church as much? Our morality and our faith walk and our life with Jesus has went down. Come on, we need the house of God. We need to get in the church. And one of the, one of the strongest things we can do is encourage somebody else to come with us, right? I, I want you to grab one of those invite cards you got right there, pick it up. You ought, you ought to put it in your pocket, have it with you, and be ready to invite somebody to church. So I think we invite those that are on the outside to come to the house of God. It's so powerful. Whenever you start to invite somebody to come to church, I believe that you literally release the Holy Spirit to begin to work in them and around them and in their life. Whenever my, my brother and my sister-in-law started inviting me to church back when I was a kid and I was partying and just destroying myself, every time they saw me, they didn't nag me, they didn't ride me, they prayed for me, and they invited me to church. And it was just like the Spirit of God started working on me, working on me, working on me. I couldn't shake it, right? And uh, I, I would come in, and, and I would go to church every now and then with them, and the power of God and the conviction of the Holy Spirit would come on my life and work in me. And uh, I didn't get saved all at once. It was a process, but it was like their invitation had power with it. I want you to know that your invitation, just like Pastor Jordan preached, there's a wedding you've been invited to. Your invitation has a power attached to it. And so I think we invite people from the outside to come in. How many of y'all want to see your lost loved ones get born again? Want to see your family members get born again? Your coworkers get born again? Your invitation has that power. And then those that are already in, when we come to the house of God, we're to encourage each other, the Bible says, to, to good works, you know. It, we're, we're to lift each other's faith and push people in closer. So people you see on the fringes in the church, you need to push them to come in closer to Jesus, right? They're, 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 you look at people that follow Jesus out there in the scripture, there are crowds that got up to 20,000 people. There are 20,000 people, it, it's called like, four or 5,000 on the days of multiplication. But the way they counted back then is they counted households. Only the males got counted back then. And you would add. So scholars say, yeah, it wasn't four or 5,000. Think about a family of four, right? If it says four or five, it's, it's, it's multiplied like that. Massive crowds, right? You got all these people that, that are there. You know, after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, the Bible says he showed himself alive to a group of over 500 people. 500 or so people saw Jesus after the resurrection. You know how many people were, were present on the day of Pentecost? He told them all, come back, right? Be endued with power from on high. 120 of those made it back, right? Out, out, out of 120, those that were with Jesus, there were 70 at one point that he sent forth two by two. He had 12 disciples. Three of those disciples were the closest to him, Peter, James, and John. Out of all of those people, there was only one of them left whenever he went to the cross. John is the only male that made it, if you're counting with their numbers, right? There were females there because the women have built the church for 2,000 years, and most of the men are in the cheap seats. Come on, y'all give the ladies a hand clap for making the church work. They always have. We need to get guys closer in, amen? So here's what I think we do. We want to invite people from the group of 20,000 to get closer in the group of four or 5,000. Amen? People from the four or 5,000, we want to push them to the, to the 500. Can I get an amen? People from the 500, we want to push them to the 120. Can I get an amen? From the 120, we want to push them to the 70. Can I get an amen? From, from the 70, we want to push them to the 12. From the 12 to the 3 and the 3 to the 1. And it's us pushing people closer to Jesus. It'll change the world. Amen. I believe God can do that in us. I really, um, I really see and think about how America has been affected the last few years, how the church is not coming together the way it used to. The stats just show it all over America, right? And if the devil can scatter us, he can defeat us. It's divide and conquer strategy. He's not going to do it here because we're going to get on the offense instead of the defense. We're going to seek and save. Come on, we're going to seek and save that which was lost. I declare it in Jesus' name. Well, all that was free, all right? If you have your Bibles on you, I want you to open it up to the Gospel of St. Matthew. Let's go to the Gospel of St. Matthew. Uh, chapter 9, we're going to start reading in verse 18. I taught last week on, uh, talked about faith, mountain-moving faith, and and 
the power of faith and the power of your words. And I just feel like we need a dose of faith in, in a world filled with doubt. Whenever people have doubt, they have fear. I'll tell you what you better do is you better preach and speak faith. Can I get an amen? When in doubt, preach faith to yourself. Most powerful revelations you'll ever get. When you're in doubt, you ought to talk faith to yourself. Amen? Preach yourself out of that with the power of your words. All right, here's what it says, Matthew 9, 18. It says this. While he spoke these things to them, behold, a ruler came and worshiped him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. So Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. And suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. For she said to herself, If only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well. But Jesus turned around, and when he saw her faith, he said, Be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. Come on, we have a healing Jesus. So here's what happens. Jesus is on his way to a ruler's house. His daughter's passed away. It's a very dark situation. She's died. This guy's got faith that if Jesus shows up, lays his hands on this young girl, that she literally will live. Come on, we've got a Jesus that's overcome death, hell, and the grave, and he holds the power of resurrection. We have a resurrecting Jesus. And now, I've never, I've never raised the dead. I'm believing God to see the dead raised. How many of y'all want to see the dead raised? I haven't, haven't seen it with my eye, but I do have a friend I grew up with that from Providence, Kentucky, uh, there are a couple of twins, Kevin and Kelly Cosby. We were raised in First Baptist Church, Providence, Kentucky together, went to the youth group. And I've got a friend that preaches in that town. Spirit-filled preacher's been there, I don't know, 25, 30 years now. And when Kevin, uh, I can't remember which one of the twins it was, because they look a whole lot alike, right? Identical twins look a lot alike. And uh, that can get you in trouble if you got the wrong twin. But I can't remember if it's Kevin or Kelly. Is at a meeting at that church, and for some reason his heart stopped. My little town, I'm from a little coal mining town, Providence, Kentucky, of a couple thousand people, and uh, the Cosby boy fell dead on the floor. And they call 911, get an ambulance out, and the response time is about like the response time in New Orleans right now. It takes two hours to get a response in New Orleans right now. Did you know that? If you get shot in New Orleans, they don't investigate it unless you die. Why don't we defund the police, huh? Makes a lot of sense. But anyway, that's another, another topic for another time. So it took forever in Kentucky to get a, uh, in Providence, to get somebody over to, to work on Kevin or Kelly. I forget which one it was. I don't want to get my, my story wrong. Uh, my stories get better as the years go by, too, right? You can change names. You get all that going. And, and, and so Pastor Tim Rigdon is the guy that's preaching there. And he starts grabbing the Cosby twin who was young. I mean, we're, we're going back like 20 years now. These guys are my age. He's like, I don't know, he's 25 or 30 at the time. And he's screaming, live. The guy's blue. There's no breath. They're checking his pulse. He's dead. And he's screaming, live. And he's praying in tongues. And he's like rocking him and shaking him. I've heard eyewitness accounts that he's slamming him into the wall, screaming, live, live, live. Right? Nobody wants to see somebody die like that in the, in the height of their, you know, young years in their life. So he's fighting for this guy. And the whole church is praying. They're doing it, uh, waiting on the ambulance. Nobody's getting there. It goes on for like 20, 30 minutes. The Cosby boy's down. And Tim's got him up screaming, live, slams him into the wall, keeps slamming into the wall. All of a sudden, Cosby sucks air. His eyes come open. Life comes back into him. And I, I'm telling you, revival hit that church and that town. That's an eyewitness account from my hometown. And I know people were there. How many of y'all believe Jesus is still in the miracle business? Amen? Talk about resurrection. I, I know another guy from, uh, his church is in Ormond Beach. All right, um, or Ormond Beach, Florida, and uh, they were having service, and it's a good-sized church. Uh, a, a lot of friends are close to him. Pastor Shane Warren preaches for us, is going to come preach out here in October, and we'll, we'll, we just confirmed that today. Uh, Pastor Shane is kind of a specialist in eschatology as well. He's going to come preach Sunday morning, powerful preacher, and then he's going to do a few days on end times theology. We'll have an end times conference, so uh, how many of y'all want to know what's coming? I like to know what's coming, right? So you don't want to miss that, but, but they're in the service of the church in Ormond Beach, first service, and uh, there's a lady that's been with them forever in the church. All right, and they're in worship, and she dies in worship. 
hits the ground dead. And I mean, come on, that messes up a worship service, right? When somebody you love dies. And, and this lady's been there forever. So it's like one of the beloved sisters in the church just drops dead. And so everybody's praying. People are coming. It's like a thousand people in the room. People weeping, crying. I mean, all that stuff's happening. She lays there dead for like 30 minutes. And she comes back to life in Ormond Beach, Florida. I got friends that were in the room. Friends that were in the room. Story. So when she comes back to life, they take her to check her out, right? And of course, obviously, church is on after the dead came back to life in first service. People are going crazy. They're worshiping the Lord. So first service stays. It rolls right into second service. They get in second service. Everybody's praising the Lord in there. You know what happens in second service? Somebody else dies in the second service. What are the odds of that happening? When I first heard it, I'm like, that cannot be true. They're like, no, it's recorded on video. We promise you, Pastor. We, we promise you. So in the second service, somebody else strokes out, falls out, dies. I don't, I don't, know, you know, I don't know how dead is dead. But anyway, two medical emergencies, two back-to-back -back services, and they look dead. I'll say that much about it. And they pray and work on the second person. Second person gets up. Ormond Beach got rocked. I mean, it turned into like extended meetings for forever. I say all that just to say our God is able to raise the dead. 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 If we didn't believe that, we ought to find a new religion because all we have is the resurrection. That's all we have. So this girl's dead laying there. Ruler comes and says, Rabbi, if you come and lay your hand on her, I believe she'll live. He is the resurrection and the life. And so Jesus says, yeah, I'll go, I'll go with you. And he's walking and he's going through a crowd. And think about it. People know who he is. He's at the height of his ministry. He's the rabbi. He's the miracle worker. They're trying to figure out who he is. His prophetic works are massive, right? He's healing sick, the sick driving out devils, blind or seeing, deaf or hearing, lame or walking. So people are wanting to get close to him. Throngs start pressing into him. Um, that they're coming around. I, I've been in situations in, in desperate nations where we're praying for the sick and, and ministering in crusade environments, and people literally will start crushing you. The crowds get big enough. If you get out in front of a stage, you can get yourself crushed. And it used to be a real concern at, at, at some of the guys' meetings like a Reinhard Bonnke, T.L. Osborne. Reinhard Bonnke would have a million people show up over a few days, right, to come and be prayed for by him. He's gone on to be with the Lord now. Um, his predecessor, the guy that followed him, excuse me, Daniel Kalinda has similar crowds. And so you can get tramplings at crusades, which is terrible. Because people are so desperate. So think about it. It's not that populated back then as it would be in Africa or Mozambique or something like that. But people are desperate. They're trying to get close to Jesus. Jesus is walking through the crowd. And all of a sudden, he feels power go out of him. Tell you what, the power of God is resident on the inside of us. The power of God is resident on the inside of you. Come on, somebody say the power's in me. Say it again, the power's in me. So the power of God's resident on the inside of you. Right here, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We teach our kids, right here's your spirit man. We're, to make it simple for the little ones, we say it's your knower. Right? The Holy Spirit will show you things to come. So how many know you know things on the inside you get in certain environments? Kids pick it up. Is the environment good? Is the environment bad? Is this person all right? Is this person a creep? Right here. Pay attention. And one of the worst things you can do is ignore this because of Christian virtue trying to be nice. You ever heard people, they, they know this, but they'll say, oh, we can't be like that? Because that wouldn't be Christian. we got to be nice to everybody. You have to be kind. You don't have to be nice. There is a difference. What are you saying, Pastor? We, all, we, we don't have to be nice? That's exactly what I'm saying. All right? Doesn't sound very pastoral. Right? But there's nowhere in the Bible that says you have to be nice. We should be nice when we could. It says the, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Take it back to the word kindness. 
You know what kindness means? It has nothing to do with being nice. It means a moral uprightness. Doing what's right. Now I've watched people ignore this. Because they were trying to be nice. And their kids ended up abused. I'm pastoring now. Does that make sense? You can't ignore this for somebody's fake Christian expectation on your life. Okay. Kind. You know, I ran into a religious leader one time, and that religious leader called some of my friends a group of snakes. You believe the nerve of that guy? It's not nice. I ran into a religious leader one time that went into a place of business in our city and said the way they were conducting business was unethical and wrong and called out my friends. That's not, this guy's supposed to be nice. I ran into a religious leader one time that brought a weapon and chased a group of guys out of the church house. He threw over tables, called them whitewashed tombs and serpents and snakes and a pit of vipers. The Jesus you read about on Facebook is not Jesus. The Jesus of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is Jesus. When is the church going to learn? Yeah, we should be nice when we can, but it's more important to follow the Holy Spirit than to make people like what you're doing in that moment. Come on, somebody give God a hand clap. We need, we need a kindness. Not always nice. Amen? Oh, I'll tell you, we got a lot of wrong ideas about who Jesus is and who Jesus isn't culturally. So I've just cast that off and I don't let people put me in their religious armbar about what I say or don't say. So uh, Jesus is, is walking, right? He feels power go out of him. His knower, right? It's, 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 he's God in the flesh. I mean, he's operating different than, than we are, but he is operating as a man anointed by the Spirit at this point, right? He, he goes and he's baptized in the Jordan River. Uh, the Spirit of God comes upon him. Come on, we, we're baptized into Jesus, and the Spirit of God is upon us. Everybody say, the anointing is on me. So you can feel it go. Times, times I don't feel anything when I pray for people, right? I lay hands on them by faith, and I pray, and I just believe God, right? Whether I feel it or not, how many of y'all know God's moving despite of our feelings? We don't walk by feelings. We walk by faith. Amen? We don't, we, it's not about what we see. It's not about what we feel. It's about what is written in the Word of God. Some will do it regardless of what I feel. So sometimes I feel absolutely nothing and people get their healed, changed, their life happens. That's faith. There, there's another thing, sometimes the anointing of God. It's always on us, but sometimes it's manifesting in a certain way. Right? And so you feel it. I lay hands on people, sometimes it's like a river goes out of my hand. You ever felt that? Like electricity coming out of you or coming into you when somebody's praying for you. Right, that's the anointing of God. Sometimes it'll feel like oil. Sometimes it'll feel like rain. I felt like a, a drunkenness in the spirit. And I don't ham that up. Some people ham that up big time and make a big scene or spectacle. That's not my style, but I, I feel that, right? It's an anointing coming out of me at times. And uh, so, so that's a, a second kind of flow of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes the glory of God comes around so thick it's in the air, it's everywhere, right? So Jesus feels this anointing. Go out. There's somebody who's reached out with faith and pulled on that gift. And he, he turns around and he says, who, who, who touched me? And there, there's a lady standing there and she's got a deer in the headlights because number one, she's unclean. She's been unclean for 12 years. She's not supposed to be in this crowd right now. See, to be ceremonially unclean during the days of Jesus is such a big deal. She'd had an issue of blood for 12 years couldn't stop bleeding. She'd seen doctors. She'd spent all of her money. She was desperate. She'd been to the Mayo Clinic. She'd been here. She'd been there. She'd been everywhere. She'd read on, on MD uh, online until she drove herself crazy. She was absolutely broke at this point, and she had one hope, right? And Jesus turns around. Who touched me? It's this woman that's been called unclean. If you were unclean according to the Torah, right, first five books of the Bible, um, Leviticus has a whole holiness or cleanness code on how you had to do life 
to come in to worship with people, to be around other people, how you had to conduct and, and, and clean your pots and pans, right? Uh, how you took care of your waste outside of your household. What's interesting, when the bubonic plague hit Europe, what happened is a lot of the Europeans were just throwing their waste out in the streets. How many think that's going to present a problem at some point, right? But the Jews in their neighborhood didn't do it. They've been taught better by Torah. And so they were taking their waste outside of the city and not having it in the street. So the plague ran rampant through, through the uh, Europeans, the, the, the Christians there, and other people. And it didn't go through the Jewish communities. And so some of these people said the people in the Jewish community are operating in witchcraft. That's why they didn't get sick. And it brought persecution to them. But they weren't operating in witchcraft. They just had the Torah because the Bible teaches us how to live a life in a way that we're not going to die of infection. Come on, God gives us wisdom. Amen? It's, it's incredible. So, so if you were unclean, you couldn't, you couldn't come around. Uh, I was reading today the, the Levitical priesthood. Whenever they would sacrifice certain animals, there was a time you would sacrifice a, a red heifer. And anybody that, that had, had slaughtered the heifer, right, burnt the ashes, carried the ashes, they were all unclean. They had to go wash and stay away from everybody till the sun went down that night just to stop infection from spreading. So if you found a spot of leprosy or something like that, people are walking up around you, you had to announce that you are unclean. It marked your life. Couldn't go to the temple, couldn't go close to people, had to keep your distance, couldn't be with family the way you used to. You'd say unclean, unclean. There were different levels of uncleanness. Um, I've heard people say that cleanliness is next to godliness is not in the Bible. I beg to differ. It's called the book of Leviticus and the entire Torah. Cleanliness matters. Our, my mother was right, right? She's right. You know, and, and I'll tell you, if you, if you, if people will allow, now I'm not a neat freak. I'm, I'm not a neat freak, right? Uh, poor Jessie living with me for all these years, right? She was raised by a neat freak. Like, like her father would vacuum you with a little vacuum while you're eating chips on the couch. I mean, it was like OCD weird right? kind of a deal. Pastor David was like that. Um, I'm not like that at all. Uh, but I do know when I've noticed if people will allow filth to accumulate around them, a spirit will start to change the environment. There's something about it. There's something there, right? So, so she walks up. She's unclean, unclean. She touches him. Power of God. She touches him with faith. The Bible says she said this to herself, verse 21. says this, for she said to herself, for she said to herself. Come on, somebody say she said to herself. Come on, say it again. She said to herself. She's talking to herself. It's faith talk. She said to herself, right? Somewhere she heard that Jesus was a healer. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. Right now we're hearing the word of God together. Our faith is growing right now. Can I get an amen? We're getting stronger and more like Jesus. Why? Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. What are we hearing? Somewhere she heard that Jesus was a healer. If you look, she reaches out and she touches what she touched. Touches the hem of his garment. Why did she touch the hem of his garment? Well, he's wearing, he's wearing a prayer shawl. Right? It's what a rabbi wore at that time. The high priest used to wear it in Israel. Goes over you, over your back when you pray. I bought them when I've been in Israel before. I've got several of them. And um, at the end of, of these uh, prayer shawls, there, there are uh, ropes that come off of every end called talit. A lot of the intricacies in them, uh, if you study them, you know there'll be representation of how many of the laws are there from, from the Torah in a lot of them. You can get them very simple. You can get them real high dollar, real, real strong, nice stuff now. But whenever the rabbis would pray and the priests would pray before the temple was, was torn down, he would hold up his arms and bless the people. And when he did, he had that shawl over him. It would look like wings. All right, turn over to Malachi chapter 4 very quickly. Malachi, just back one chapter. Chapter 4, I'll show you a prophecy. She heard that Jesus was a healer, all right? She would have been familiar with the teaching of the prophets. She's there. Here's what it says. Malachi chapter 4, verse 2. But to you who fear my name. Does anybody fear his name out there? 
The son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. And you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. Don't be embarrassed about those love handles. The fatness is a gift of God. Amen. Amen. So she heard from Malachi the prophet. She knew that word. She heard that he was healing people. And she said in her heart, she took faith to what she heard out there about Jesus and faith to what was written by the prophet Malachi, like, like I don't know, 500 years before this happened, something like that. She, she, took, she took faith in the word and faith what she heard, and she, she snuck up behind Jesus. And she reached out, not just with any reach, she reached out with the reach of faith, and she grabbed the hem of his garment. And when she grabbed the hem of his garment, the power of God came out of him, and she was made whole according to her faith is what the Bible says, according to your faith, you have been made whole. See, the son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. Where did it start? It all started with the hearing of faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The psalmist said, once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to the Lord. Once, everybody say once. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this. How many times did God speak? How many times did the psalmist uh, hear it? God spoke it once. Then the psalmist repeated it. He heard God say it, then he said it. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to the Lord. Tell you what, whenever you hear God speak, you better start saying what God said about your situation. Once God has spoken, now twice will I hear this, power belongs to the Lord. Yeah, the economy's going down, but God said, I'll be blessed, and God owns prosperity. Can I get an amen? Yeah, I got a bad report in my body, but the Bible says I'm whole, so I'm going to say I'm whole, and healing is going to manifest. Come on, somebody. Yeah, I might be depressed a little bit, but the joy of the Lord's my strength. God says I got joy, so I declare I have joy instead of depression and God's lifted me up out of this pit. Come on somebody. Amen. Once God has spoken twice have I heard this that power belongs to the Lord. So this woman got faith. She heard. She hooked her life around it. She started saying it to herself. What are we saying to ourselves? Amen. Just came out of a meeting just right before I walked into this one. And the guy was talking. He's teaching about what we say of ourselves and what we say to people around us. We ought to speak faith into the people around us. We ought to speak faith into our family members. Can I get an amen? Speak faith into, into whoever we come into contact with. Don't be brokers of doubt. Be brokers of hope. Amen? Brokers of faith. Uh, how are we speaking to one another? Come on. I, I believe you, you're, you're an overcomer. I believe you have victory in your life. I believe you're a faith person. I believe you're going upward and upward. I believe no weapon formed against you will prosper. I believe God's leading you into a land that flows with milk and honey. I believe you're never going to die in the wilderness. You're going to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. I believe you're whole. I believe you're prospered. You're going forward every day. I believe you're generous and you're blessed. I believe you're an example of Jesus. Come on, somebody. I believe you have the fruit of the Spirit. I believe you operate in the gifts of the Spirit. I believe you're a righteous man and a righteous woman. Right? We ought to speak faith into one another. You know, I heard a guy talking. He's like, you could take identical twins. Talk to one of them. What if you took them and put them in two different houses, identical twins? You spoke to one of them. You told them they were a failure every day of their life. Piece of trash. You'll never amount to anything. You're never going to accomplish anything. You're never going to do anything that matters. You're a loser. All you do is lose. You took the same person, very similar DNA, similar traits, right? And you spoke to him and said, you're a winner. You're going to be somebody. You're going to rise higher in life. God's going to use you. You're made in the image of God. You're wonderful. You're smart. You're intelligent. You got what it takes, kid. I believe in you, right? You might have somebody with all similar skill set, similar DNA, similar makeup. These words of death will hurt this kid. These words of life will lift this kid. Right? Life and death are in the power of the tongue. Those who love it will eat the fruit thereof. Come on. This world's got a negative drag, does it not? It's a fallen world system. It'll pull you down. 
I'll tell you why we have the word of God. Because the word of God will lift us up. God's given us the answer. Right? We got the antidote right here to the broken world system. And I can just tell you, some, I've, been, I've been getting up real early. Right? My son plays, his football practice is preschool before he goes to school in the sixth grade, which is awesome, right? Praise the Lord for that. It's terrible. <laughs> it's terrible, right? It's like you're putting your boots on at 5 a.m. out the door. And uh, so, like, I'm eating supper with the senior citizens, and I get the discount now, you know, at like 4 o'clock in the afternoon because my beard's white. Um, I'm tired by then. I'm ready to go home. And, uh, but, but I'll say this. If I, if I go... If I stop, drop him off, and I stop, and I soak in the Spirit of God, talk to God, pray, right? And I read the Bible. A lot of people are very worship prayer oriented, and I love to worship and pray, but I'm, I'm really, my Ben's like always been, I'm a, I'm a Bible guy, right? It's always come easier for me. And if I will, if I'll open up the Word, let the words of life start my day, right? And I get busy or distracted. That happens to everybody. So have you ever been busy and distracted and not read your Bible? I have. I can tell the trajectory of my day is so different when I start it with the Word of God. Doesn't mean I won't have any troubles or stuff I got to work through, but it's like it sets my heart and my expectation, regardless of what I run into that day, that God is on my side. He's for me. He's with me. He's a covenant-making, covenant-keeping God. It stirs up my faith, and it's a reminder, right? Hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Come on, we need that. Amen? We need to hear the Word of Jesus and then say it to ourselves, just like the woman with the issue of blood. She reaches out. She touches the hem of his garment. Would you stand up on your feet with me? Stand up on your feet with me. Man, there's nothing special about this altar I'm standing on, except we've dedicated it to the Lord. That makes it special. But there's nothing special about brick and mortar. There really isn't. Like, this room is special. It's sacred because we're here. We've made this a sacred space because we dwell here and pray here. And it's about the people, not about the edifice. Can I get an amen out there, right? Amen. Nothing special. There was really nothing special about that garment that she reached out and grabbed. It was about the person that it was on, the person of Jesus. Her faith hooked to that. Amen. You know, I, I just want to, if some of you got, you got real issues you need, you need help with, you need God's help with, I want to give you just a couple of minutes. Now, I want you to come and just, I want you to come and touch this altar right here. Right? The Bible says, build an altar, bring my people, and I will come down and bless them at it. So I'm just going to hook my faith for one moment to that word. Not, not just because Jesus is here. So I want you to take an act of your faith. If you need something removed out of your life, this woman needed that, that blood to stop. She got healed. Maybe you need a financial breakthrough. Maybe you need a healing in your body. Maybe you got a relationship on the rocks you need help with. Maybe, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's, maybe it's money. Maybe it's depression. Maybe it's addiction. I, I don't know. It doesn't matter to me. I don't care. I'm for you, not against you. I want you to come out of your seat and come just touch this altar for one second. I want to I pray for you. I want to pray for you. God's going to meet you. I believe it because he will arise with healing in his wings. The son of righteousness will arise with healing. I said the son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. You'll go out and you'll grow fat like a stall-fed calf is what he said. You'll go out and you'll grow fat like a stall-fed calf. The son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. Come on, I want you just to say this to the Lord right there where you are. Say this. Say, Father, I believe that Jesus has my answer. Right now we declare, we decree that we're reaching out and we're touching you by faith. We say that you arise in our situation. And we are blessed and touched and helped. We declare it in the name of Jesus. 
Pastor Jordan, start on that end, and we're just going to go by behind him and pray for him right there. Just reach out and, and touch that altar. Touch that altar. If you want to pray in the Spirit, begin to pray in the Spirit. Father, we bless these people. We thank you that you move on their behalf. Move in their life. Lord, we don't know their needs. You know their needs. But we know that you have the answer. You have the answer. Church, just stretch your hands towards them. Let's pray for them. You have the answer. You shall arise with healing in your wings. We declare miracles. We declare help from heaven. We declare blessing. We declare breakthrough. We declare the wisdom of God. We know what to do. We declare we know what to do. We know what to do because you know what to do. Right now, Father, we bless them. We pray for them. We thank you that you help them. You move. Father, I thank you that this, this sickness is not unto death in their life, but that the glory of God could be revealed in them. Father, I thank you that you touch bodies from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet. Lord, that you calm minds. I say peace, peace surpasses all, under, surpasses all understanding. Peace surpasses all understanding, guards their heart, guards their mind in Christ Jesus. Lord, we believe right now by faith that you're doing something, something good is happening to them. Something good, something good. I see the glory of God visiting your house. I see God giving you answers and help from heaven. I see God, God opening doors and speaking and lifting. I declare it in the name of Jesus. 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 In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I bless them even now. I bless them even now. I bless them even now. I thank you for your help. And your hand, your help in your hand, in my brother's and in my sister's life and in your church. Father, your help and your hand. Your help and your hand. In Jesus' mighty, mighty, mighty name. Lord, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you. We thank you, we thank you. Come on, if you pray in the spirit, just lift up that heavenly language for one moment. Right there where you are, lift up that heavenly language. Right there, right there, right there where you are. Right there where you are. Be helped, be blessed, be filled, be lifted. Help from heaven, help from heaven. Help from heaven. Help from heaven. In Jesus, in Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. Somebody you're praying for a young man. It's lost. He's, he's, he's like out of sorts. He's not doing what he's supposed to be doing. God says he's going to change that direction. He's going to save him. He's going to fill him with his spirit, and he's going to call him into the ministry. That's what the spirit of God says. That kid is coming out of darkness. He's coming into light. I declare it in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Lord, we'll see it done. 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 God, God's moving on your behalf. God's moving. He's seen your heart. He's heard your cry. And he's going to deliver. That's what he says. Seen your heart. He's heard your cry. And he's going to deliver. We declare it. We declare it. I release my faith for it now. Shika Bramba. By the authority of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I declare a turnaround. In Jesus' mighty, mighty, mighty name. Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. Mir miracles in, in the body. Miracles, miracles in the body. 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 Miracles in, just lift your hand to heaven right there where you are. I declare, I declare the miracle working power of God. The miracle working power of God into your body, Shh. in Jesus' mighty name, in Jesus' mighty name, in, Je Shh. in Jesus' mighty, mighty, mighty name, I declare it in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you that you sent your word, you healed them, you delivered them from their destructions. Tony Ryder, God's going to do something for you guys, real big, real big, real big. Get your expectation up. Start thanking him for what he's going to do in y'all's life. You know, just thank him every morning right now for what he's going to do in your life. 
I declare help from heaven. Come on, how many of y'all believe our Jesus? He arises with healing in his wings. Come on, let's give him one more hand clap. He's a good God. Amen. I love y'all. Believing with you. How many of y'all believe we got our answer, right? Whether we see it or not, we got our answer. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and tell him your answer. You already have it. Just tell him that.